Data Junkies, welcome back. I'm your host, Sean Jansen. We're getting ready to start the big finale in our video series here, Multiple Linear Regression. That's right, this is the big final workhorse. Uh, I will release additional videos later on on other topics, but this is really the big grand finale that the statistics course is heading towards. So let's go ahead and just talk about a few of the major topics that you're going to find in this particular series. And it's a little bit of a longer series as we wrap it up. So we're set forward the foundations. We're going to run through some examples. I'm going to introduce again this uh, concept of dummy variables in the reference group, what it means once we take it from simple linear regression into multiple linear regression. We're going to do some videos with additional examples. Then we're going to talk about multicollinearity, that assumption that we didn't really touch on from the simple linear regression section. So we're going to come back to that. We're going to have another chat about model selection. And then we're going to go into some interesting things you can do now that you can have multiple variables in your model, multiple independent variables in your model, where we can talk about things like interaction terms, transformations, polynomial variables, what it means to standardize your variables. And uh, we're going to close it off with just a bonus topic on some, how to do some causal diagrams. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our talk on multiple linear regression foundations. Now, the big thing that we're going to be seeing here as we transition from simple regression into multiple regression is this concept of going from one, indep in, one independent variable into many independent variables. This could be a minimum of two, or it could be a hundred, depending on the size of your model, what it is you're looking to capture, etc. And now, once you have multiple independent variables, they can work to explain some of the variation in the dependent variable. Each one's going to take away a little bit of it. But because of the way we put into it mathematically, we can do what's called controlling for the other variables. Think of it as freezing one variable at some given value, and then it allows you to work the levers and controls of another independent variable. And so as you work the levers and controls of that independent variable, you can see how the dependent variable responds when you stick uh, that additional second independent variable, and you freeze it at one particular value. And then you can keep doing this iteratively as you move through. And so you consider that we are controlling for the extra variation. We are controlling for different values that we could have in, in the particular model with each additional independent variable that we're putting in here. Now, keeping that in mind, we're still trying to find the best line of fit through minimizing the residual sums of squares. That's the strategy and approach we were using in OLS for simple linear regression, OLS being ordinary least squares. And we're going to continue this method into the multiple linear regression as well. When we're looking at the formula, it's a natural expansion. Simple linear regression had the y variable on the left side of the equal sign. On the right side, we had b0 plus b1x1 and some amount of error, where b1x1 were the coefficient and values for the first independent variable. Now that we're in multiple regression land, we're going to keep that same exact simple regression formula, except we're going to add in b2x2, b3x3, and so on and so on until we get to bnxn, where bnxn just happens to be the last highest number independent variable that we're putting into the model. We still have the y-intercept, we still have our error term, and so on. So why are we worried about going into this land of multiple regression? Why make it more mathematically difficult for us? Because we can explain more variance. And again, remember, explaining variation is a fantastic thing to do. If you can explain variation, you can get a better understanding of why things happen. And so by having more of these variables in the model, we are able to control for each of these. We are working to see how different predictors work with each other as well. And I have on the screen for you, again, just sort of how the model builds out with taking more variables into account. Now, keeping in mind that as we introduce more independent variables, we're updating our knowledge on how well we can predict y given our new data points of x. And that could change the slope, but the interpretations for them remain the same. So we're looking at here is still saying that a one unit increase in x is related to a b unit's increase in y, but we're adding on some new language. Each additional variable we're adding into the model is going to hold all other variables constant. Or you could change language, all variables in the model constant, all else equal, accounting for all other variables in the model, holding all other variables fixed. These are all synonyms. They're all equally exchangeable terms that you can use so you don't necessarily sound like a robot all the time saying the same exact thing, but you're cluing your reader in to say, here is the change in coefficient that I'm looking at, here's the impact it's causing, 
given my understanding of all of these extra variables that happen to be in my model. So you can sort of think of this when we're talking about the entire model as a whole, as sort of this all for one, one for all sort of thing where the F statistic and the P value for that F statistic is talking about all of your independent variables and the Y intercept. Will they be statistically significant or not? given it. Now you don't have to have each coefficient to be statistically significant to have your entire model statistically significant, but you're going to need to have at least one. Think of back to our good old ANOVA days, where you had to have at least one pairwise difference that was statistically significant. Well, you're going to need to have at least one variable coefficient that's statistically significant in order to get the F statistic for your multiple regression to be as well. Now to come back to the hypothesis testing here, we had just said that the F test for the entire model now is going to be looking to see how well does your model do with all of your independent variables together compared to no independent variables at all. Again, when there's no independent variables at all, it's predicting with the mean of the dependent variable. So does the mean of the dependent variable predict better than having any of the independent variables that you have at all? That extends out to the R squared, where the R squared says, given all of the variables you have in your model, is the ability for them to explain variance equal to zero? or not zero. And as we go ahead and deal with this, each variable going into our model is going to have its own null and alternative hypothesis, where the coefficient for each independent variable you put into there could be a coefficient of zero or not zero. So again, just to repeat, each independent variable in your model is going to have its own p-value that's going to contrast to see if that particular slope for that particular coefficient is going to be equal to zero or not zero. Now I just want to kind of introduce you to show you talking a little bit about visualizing multiple regressions. It is not an easy thing to do and we have some human limitations on to how we can see and understand these sorts of things. So we generally start with just sort of scatter plots, scatter plot matrices and this is one that I showed you before out of the performance analytics package where we can see some histograms for each variable, the correlation coefficients for each pairwise for the variables and the scatter plots that go with them as well. And this just sort of helps us get a sense of how each variable, more specifically the dependent variable, is going to pair up with each independent variable as well. We're going to get to how these are also useful pairing independent versus independent variable when we get to multicollinearity. But when we're talking about trying to make a scatter plot with multiple independent variables all crammed in there to one, we kind of run into a cognitive barrier. The human mind does not see well in multiple dimensions. We try to do some tricks with plotting out three-dimensional spaces on a two-dimensional plane. And so we can do some things like rotating and plotting out multiple planes. Uh, we can introduce other components where we can have our x's and y's and maybe a dimension of z, but we can also change the colors of dots, the shapes and symbols of dots in order to add in additional independent variables. But there comes to be a point where we're going to hit the sort of saturation limit. So for this particular course, I'm not going to require you to make plots for multiple linear regression. If I do, it's only going to be two variables at a time, one independent and the dependent, and you may make several of them. But there are tools out there to help you learn how to make multiple regression plots with a limited number of independent variables. And with that, we're going to take a brief break, and when we come back, we're going to do some multiple linear regression examples so we can see some of this in action. I'll see you then.